This is the second video on Fourier series. In the first video, I introduced the idea, I gave you an example, and I derived the key formula, which says that if you have a function f of x, which is defined on the interval minus pi to pi, you can write that function as the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity of some coefficient, c sub n, e to the i and x. And the formula for the coefficients is an integral from minus pi to pi, the domain over which we are working, of the function we are writing in a series, times e to the minus i n x dx. The example I gave you was a step function. So we considered f of x equals the function that is 0 when x is between minus pi and 0, and 1 when x is between 0 and pi. So if you like, here's the picture of it. There's minus pi, there's pi, it's 0 here, and it's 1 here, and it has a discontinuity at 0. So it's a step function if we think about it as restricted to minus pi to pi, or if we think about it as a 2 pi periodic function, where we just make carbon copies of it moving to the right and to the left, then it's a square wave. And I asserted last time that it could be approximated as a sum involving the sine function. And now let's derive it. So there are two steps. The first is to do this integral. It's straightforward, but you have to be careful. There are a number of pitfalls I'll point out as we go along the way. And then the second step is to re-express this complex thing in a manifestly real form. So first, the integral. Well, we're integrating a function f of x that we've kind of given in two pieces, right? So the first thing to do is to split up the integral into those two pieces. So it's 1 over 2 pi minus pi to 0 f of x e to the minus i n x dx plus the next term, integral 0 to pi f of x e to the minus i n x dx. So I haven't done anything fancy here. This would be true for any function f of x. I've just taken an integral from minus pi to pi, and I've written it in two pieces, the first half over here and the second half over there. But this is useful for our particular function f of x because it comes in two separate pieces. So in this integral, we only ever range from minus pi to 0, where f of x is 0. This term actually doesn't contribute at all. And in this second integral, we range from 0 to pi, where f of x is 1. Now, don't let the point of discontinuity concern you. The point of discontinuity is a very special point that we'll talk about a little in the final video. But for now, just realize that the Fourier series doesn't care what value we assign the function there. Here I didn't actually assign it any value because I used strict less than, not less than or equal to. But whatever value I assigned it, the integral doesn't care about it. Integrals don't care about sets of measure zero. The C sub n doesn't care about it, and the series doesn't care about it. The sense in which the series approximates the function there we'll talk about later. But for now, we're just not going to worry about it. So all we have left over here is the second integral. The second integral says that we should integrate e to the minus, I got the 1 over 2 pi, that's important. Second integral says that we should integrate from 0 to pi e to the minus i n x dx. All right, pitfall number one. This looks like an easy integral. Right, it's an exponential. So it's just 1 over minus i n 
e to the minus i n x. Evaluate it from 0 to pi. Looks good, right? But there's a problem with this if n equals 0. Right? This doesn't make sense if n equals 0, and that's telling you that the, the antiderivative wasn't correct. Right, because if this says n equals 0, then this is just 1, and the antiderivative is just x. It's not this thing, right? So be careful. The c sub 0 term often requires special treatment. So usually you do c0 separately. All right, so this expression that we're working on now is for n not equal to 0. Okay, we'll come back to C0 at the end, but that's pitfall number one. Okay, remember that sort of thing. Okay, now your temptation might be to use Euler's formula and delve into sines and cosines because you're more familiar with it. Don't do that. That's harder. You have to remember all sorts of stuff or draw little pictures. Just go back to the complex plane. It's really quite simple to figure out what e to the i and x is. So let's write it as two terms, e to the minus 2 pi i n times e to the minus i pi x, that's this part up here, minus e to the i 0, which is 1. Sorry, it's n. The first term here, we set x equals pi and leave n in there. Now we go to the complex plane to figure out what this thing is, e to the minus i n pi. So here's my complex plane. Let's start with n equals uh, 1. So for n equals 1, this is e to the minus i pi. So there's e to the minus i pi, right? It's pi degrees around in the um, clockwise direction because it's a minus sign, so we end up at minus 1. Right, so minus 1 is e to the minus i pi. But minus 1 is also e to the plus i pi. Right? That would just be going around in the upper half of the plane. So that includes n equals minus 1 as well, where we get e to the i pi. But this number minus 1 is also equal to e to the, e to the 3 pi i. It's equal to e to the minus 17 pi i. Any odd number. Stick it in there, e to the odd number pi i is going to give you minus 1. So anytime n is odd, this is minus 1. What about if n is even? Well, let's take n equals minus 2, say. So we get e to the 2 pi i. Well, that's just this point, right? 1. Start here, you go around once. If it's 2 pi i, you come back to 1. 1 is also equal to e to the 4 pi i, e to the minus 6 pi i, e to the minus 28,000 pi i. Doesn't matter. Any even number is always going to give you 1. So this thing is actually equal to plus 1 when n is even, but not 0. We excluded 0 already. Not going to bother writing that. I'm just going to leave it like this for this expression. Okay, great. So now we simplify things down here. If n is odd, we're going to have minus 1 and minus 1, so we're going to get minus 2. That's going to cancel this minus 2, so we're going to have 1 over pi i n when n is odd. And when n is even, this is plus 1, minus 1 is 0, so you're going to get 0 and even. And that's the answer for c sub n, if n is not 0. Now we come back to the last part, so let me do even, not 0, and now let's do c sub 0 separately. We'll put that over here. C sub 0 is 1 over 2 pi integral minus pi 2 pi of, well, we can start here. This is the first place we need to, to do n equals 0 separately. So that's 1 over 2 pi integral from 0 to pi of just dx. 
which is equal to 1 over 2 pi times just the length of this integral, pi, which is equal to a half. Okay. So now what I will do is I'll erase everything we have, except for the c sub n. I'll copy the result for c sub n over here. So we found out that c sub n was following. It was a half if n equals 0. That's this answer. It was 1 over pi i n. When n is odd, and it was zero when n is even and not zero. So step one is complete. That is the answer for the complex form of the Fourier series. But in this class, we're mainly expanding real functions f, and so it's a little funny to have a real function f on the left hand side written as a big sum involving a bunch of complex numbers c sub n times a bunch of complex functions e to the i n x. So what we would like to be able to do is write the right hand side in a manifestly real form using sines and cosines. Now the key formula of course is Euler's formula e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. But you don't really want to start plugging in right away because you have all these special cases and it's going to get quite unwieldy. So I have two recommendations for doing these types of problems. Recommendation one is plug in. Um, it, sorry, is write out terms explicitly at this stage. Don't leave it in this very um, precise but uh, annoying notation up here. And advice number two is to wait until the last possible minute to use this formula, or even use it in this form. Notice that e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over 2 is equal to cos theta plus i sine theta plus cos theta going to need more room for this. Let's just derive it here. So notice that e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over 2 is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. That's the first term. The second term is cosine minus theta plus i sine minus theta. And the whole thing gets multiplied by a half. But remember, cosine is an even function, so I can just erase that. Sine is an odd function, so I can pull out the minus sign. Now I get a cancellation between i sine theta and minus i sine theta. These are the same term, so that becomes 2 cosine theta, which cancels the 1 half. So this thing is actually equal to cosine theta. And that's a very useful formula to remember. One half e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta is cosine theta. And there's a similar formula, exact same derivation for sine, except you have to divide by 2i. And so we get a half e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta, that would end up giving you factors of i, and so we need to stick in 1 over 2i there. And you may recognize this as just an expression for the real part. Any complex number z, you add its conjugate z bar, divide by 2, it gives you the real part of that number. The real part of e to the i theta is cosine theta, and similarly over here. Anyway, you don't have to use these formulas, it's just my advice. This is usually easier for Fourier series than plugging in directly with the e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. Okay, so let's put this into action. 
So the first thing we're going to do is write out terms. So let's start with C0, that's a half. Now let's do the odd terms next. Why not? So the odd, well, there are no even terms, so let's do the, the positive n term. So let's write C1 into the ix plus what is C1? C1 is 1 over pi i. And then let's go to uh, C2 is 0, C3 is 1 over 3 pi i, into 3 ix. Uh, C5 is 1 over 5 pi i, into 5 pi x. All the higher odd numbers, and now let's do the negative ones. 1 over minus pi i into minus i x, right? So this term here was n equals 1. This term here is n equals minus 1. They're both odd numbers. This term here was n equals 0. What other negative numbers do we have? We have 1 over minus 3 pi i from n equals minus 3 plus 3 up here, e to the minus 3ix, let's do one more, e to the minus 5 pi i, e to the minus 5 ix, etc. Okay, so this is going to be easier to work with because now we're going to notice that various terms collect themselves into exactly these kinds of formulas. So 1 half, not much I can do with that, we'll just leave the one half. But now let's look at these two terms. Okay? These two terms look an awful lot like a subtraction, and we divide by something involving i. So if we collect them together, let's write it as, to make it exactly like that, let's say we want to write out a 1 over 2i, e to the ix minus e to the minus ix. So what do I have to multiply here to get the coefficient right? Well, there's supposed to be a 1 over pi. And there's not supposed to be this 2 here, so I need to put a 2 over pi. These two terms are now grouped into a form that looks just like sine theta. In fact, it is sine theta. So this here is just 2 over pi sine x. Okay, so that came from the n equals 1 terms. Well, now we do the same thing with n equals 3, and it's going to be exactly the same prefactor, 2 over pi, 1 over 2i, to cancel the 2s. And now what we have here is an extra one third e to the three i x minus e to the minus three i x from these two terms. So again, we recognize this thing as sine of theta, where theta is now three x, and so we in fact have two over pi sine three x and so on. The 5x terms are going to be exactly the same. 2 over pi sine 5x, etc. And that's our Fourier series. The stepped function can be written in the manifestly real form. No i's anywhere, just good old-fashioned sines and cosines. And this is the answer that I had presented you with in the last video.